Grace and peace be upon you. Welcome to our channel. I'm Apostle Hefseva and welcome to this, uh, our teaching on Hoshana Rabbah. I pray that you've been having a great uh, time during Sukkot and I pray that you've also been blessed by the Psalms that we have been posting on the channel and also the teaching that we did on the first day of Sukkot. I pray that you enjoyed our time yesterday as we observed the Hakel commandment to read and listen to the words of the Torah. And I have been sharing with you from the very beginning of the new year, 5783, that this is a Hakel year. This is a year when wisdom and knowledge is going to be available to the people of Hashem because of the spiritual atmosphere that is associated with a Hakel year. It's a time when great revelation and insight is going to come to us as the people of Hashem through his Torah. And today we're going to see that already Hashem is opening the windows of heaven and pouring down upon us his people, amazing insights. There are things that, you know, we see in the word of Hashem. Maybe you have been seeing it all these years. Maybe you have had one understanding of a particular topic. But in this Hakel year, we're going to be seeing so many deep insights into the word of God, but the wisdom that is coming to God's people is not only as it relates to the Torah, but because of the atmosphere that we're in, you are going to be able to understand a lot of complex topics and issues and so on. So I pray that you're looking forward to that and I hope that you are blessed by hearing the word of Hashem yesterday and that you have already grasped or held on to this, this time that we are in. So today we observe Hoshana Rabbah and this means the great Hoshana or the great salvation. Now this is a very spiritual and symbolic day and it speaks to so many things prophetically and uh, there is going to, coming out of our teaching, our time today, going to be so much insight coming to us from the Ruach HaKodesh. Let us jump into what the Ruach has for us today. Now, in the Gospels, we read about Hoshana Rabbah. Now, for those of you who are new to these feasts and holidays, maybe that, you know, kind of just passed you by, but Baruch Hashem, now that you are listening to the Torah and now that you're learning more about these holy times, a lot of things that are written in scripture is going to become clearer to you. So I want us to begin by taking a look at John chapter 7. So chapter 7 of the book of John is really talking about Yeshua going to Jerusalem for the festival. In scripture, when you read about the festival, it's usually in reference to Sukkot. So chapter 7 is really about all the things that happened when Yeshua went to celebrate Sukkot at the temple in Jerusalem. As we all know, Sukkot is one of those pilgrimage feasts where Yeshua, where Hashem instructed that all of Israel, they were to take the journey to Jerusalem and they were supposed to spend the duration of the festival there. So Yeshua is in Jerusalem for the festival. Now let's pick up in verse 37 to see what happened on Hoshana Rabbah. So it says, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Yeshua stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. 
Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were to later receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not yet been given since Yeshua had not yet been glorified. So, on Hoshana Rabbah, Yeshua is in the temple and there are lots of rituals that's taking place in the temple. There are lots of rituals that would have taken place throughout Sukkot, but on the seventh day, the rituals were heightened. And one of the rituals taking place on this day was what we call the water drawing ceremony or the ceremony of the water libation. So throughout Sukkot, the priests would go to Siloam and they would get what is called living water from the pool and they would walk up to the temple and they would pour the water upon the altar. And they would do that beginning on the second day of Sukkot and it would continue through to the seventh day. So on the seventh day, when this water libation ceremony was taking place in the temple, this is when Yeshua got up and made this uh, statement. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. And the writer says that he made this statement in reference to the Ruach HaKodesh, who those who believed in him were later to receive. So we know that one of the meanings of the water libation in um this ceremony or in Hoshana Rabbah when the temple stood was pointing to the outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh and to be honest with you that's what most of us are familiar with the water libation ceremony and Yeshua's connection to the outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh to this water drawing ceremony but today we're going to get deeper insights into Hoshana Rabbah. So what we're going to do now is we are going to go back. We're going to take a look at how Hoshana Rabbah was celebrated or observed in the second temple period in more detail. And then we're going to look at how we observe it today. We do not have a temple in Jerusalem anymore. However, aspects of Hoshana Rabbah are retained and still practiced today in our synagogues. So we're going to take a look at that, how Hoshana Rabbah is um, observed today. And then we're going to take a look at Hoshana Rabbah in the future. What was Hoshana Rabbah and all of the prayers associated with this great day, this last day, this great salvation? How is it? That we're going to see that playing out in the end of days. So let's get right into it. During temple times, Sukkot was the period where the farmers would bring in the last of their harvest for the agricultural year. So Sukkot was a pilgrimage feast. Hashem gave instructions for everybody to come to Jerusalem to celebrate Sukkot, but it was also a time of a celebration and rejoicing because by this time, all the farmers would have brought in the last of their harvest. So it's a time of great rejoicing. All the storehouses are filled. And of course, everybody is taking to Jerusalem the portion that would belong to Hashem. And when they got to Jerusalem, they would have built their sukkahs. And, you know, it would have been just an amazing time for Hashem's people. They would be rejoicing before Hashem. Now, Sukkot had a lot of rituals involved. So Every day, the people would be at the temple, right? And the priests would be carrying out all of these various rituals, like the water libation that I just shared with you before. And of course, there would be a number of uh, prayers and poems that would be chanted throughout this time and so on. And the prayers that would be said around this time, we call those prayers Hoshanot. And Hoshanot comes from 
Hoshana, which means please save us or bring us salvation. And so these prayers were being said. Now, there is another meaning to the water libation. Okay, so Yeshua used it to speak to the pouring out of the spirit that would later come. But the water libation was actually a ritual that was done um, asking Hashem to bring rain. So it was a rain ritual too. And how that would work is, as an agricultural society, rainfall was very important to the people. If there was no rain, then it means that there would be no harvest come spring. Okay, so during Sukkot, as the water libation was being done, there would be prayers asking Hashem for success and asking Hashem to cause the rains to fall and so on and so forth. Now, a lot of persons talk about the latter rain and the early rain or the early rain and the latter rain without understanding what they mean. So the early rain for Israel would be the rains that would begin to fall in October. Now, if there is no rain, then he can't sow any seed. So he's asking for the early rain. The latter rain comes in May of the following year on the Gregorian calendar, that is. It would be in May and that rainfall in May would be necessary for the first harvest, which is the barley harvest, to begin to ripen, right? So the barley crops would get the latter rain and that would help them to ripen and so on. So rain was very important. So now we understand the importance of this rain ritual during Sukkot. The people are asking Hashem for rain. Now, in addition to the water libation ceremony that would go on throughout the period, there is also another ceremony, and this involves willow branches. According to the Mishnah in Sukkah 4 5, the origins of the ritual of the willow goes all the way back to the temple period. So it is said that the priests would go down to a place called Mutza and they would gather up branches of willow and they would bring it back to the altar. These are tall willow um, branches now. And they would lean them against the altar of Hashem. And because the willow branches were so tall, they would kind of bend over. They would bend over and create like a canopy over the altar, right? So this is how they would decorate the altar of Hashem. Now, in addition to this decorating of the altar and the water libation and the prayers, the Hoshenot prayers, the people would also do something else. On the days of Sukkot, for six days, the priests would make a circuit around the altar of Hashem once per day. However, on Hoshana Rabbah, on the seventh day, the priests would circle the altar of Hashem seven times. And while they are making this circuit around the altar seven times, they would be crying out, Hoshiana, save us. So they're, they're doing all of these prayers that begin with the words Hoshana and end with the words Hoshana, asking Hashem to save them. So let's take a look at how Sukkot is celebrated today in the synagogues. So from the beginning of Sukkot all the way to day six, we say Hoshano prayers. So we are still saying the prayers that were said in the second temple period and so on and so forth. It's just that now we don't have the altar so what is done in the shows is that the ark is opened, the aron is opened, and the Torah scroll is taken out of the ark. It's put upon a bima, that is a platform type of structure, and the congregation walks around this bima, right, once per day. 
the whole congregation walks around the bima. And of course, they are saying the hoshanot prayers. And there are different types of hoshanot prayers. Different types of prayers that the people are praying as they're going around the bima. And they do this for six days. On Hoshana Rabbah, however, the bima is circled seven times. Okay, seven times. Not only that, but when they get to the end of the service on Hoshana Rabbah, the people put aside their lulav and their etrog, and they pick up a bundle of willow uh, sprigs, right? And they begin to beat the sprigs on the ground and they pray, Hoshiana, Hoshiana, right? All of these different types of Hoshiana prayers. And the prayers get, they intensify and so on and so forth. And they are beating the ground with the, with the, with the sprigs and so on. And usually the bundle of willow has five sprigs, okay? We know that numbers are significant in scripture and five speaks to grace, okay? So they are beating the willow on the ground and the willow, right, is connected to the willow that the priests would decorate the altar with when the temple stood. Right? So we don't have those huge willow um, branches, but we use willow twigs now and each person has the willow twigs and they beat the willow twigs on the ground. And sometimes they beat it so hard that the leaves of the willow twigs begin to fall off. Now, all of this may sound very off to some persons, but let me tell you something. Every single ritual that is performed on Hoshana Rabbah is significant. It had meaning for Israel then. It has meaning for us today. But most importantly, as we will see, is the, pro pro is the prophetic significance of these acts for the future. Now, before we get to the future, I want us to go now to the end of the Hoshano prayers that are said on Hoshana Rabbah. At the end of the service, the congregants, after they have beaten their willow sprigs on the ground, right, they say another prayer. So they're closing the ceremony now. But they say a weird kind of prayer. And the prayer is about a voice that proclaims something, okay? So it says in English, a voice proclaims, proclaiming and declaring. But interesting, interestingly, it doesn't tell us what the voice is proclaiming and declaring. So that's left like a type of mystery. Nobody knows what this voice that is proclaiming and declaring says. And then the service comes to an end. So it's like we're left hanging, a voice proclaiming, proclaiming and declaring what? Nobody knows, okay? Now, when we talk about a voice in scripture, you know, like usually when a prophet is having a, 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 a prophetic dream or vision or so, and it says, and I heard a voice from heaven, it is usually in reference to the Father. It's usually in reference to God. And this takes us back to the book of Exodus when the Torah was being given. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 15, we read that the people heard the voice of God. They saw the voices of thunder, but they saw no form. And as such, 
Hashem gave Moses instructions to tell the people, you shall not make any image of me. You shall not make any image of anything in the sea, anything on land or anything in the sky as a representation of me because you don't know anything about what I look like. As a matter of fact, the rabbis will tell us that God has no form. Okay, and he doesn't have a body because a body speaks to limitations. God has no body because he's not limited and bound by anything. So he has no form. And this is why every revelation of God comes with the voice of God. There is no form, just a voice. Okay, so the fact that this prayer um, that ends Hoshan Rabbah is talking about a voice that is proclaiming and declaring something, but it doesn't say what the voice is declaring or proclaiming, is a direct reference to the Father, right? So whatever is happening on Hoshan Rabbah is going to call, it's going to trigger a response from God, but we don't know what that response is because the prayer doesn't say what that response is, okay? All we know is after all of the water libations and the beating of the willow and the walking around the bima seven times, I mean, one time each day and then seven times on Hoshan Rabbah is going to trigger something. Okay, and God is going to speak. Now, this is also a reminder to us about something that happened in scripture in the book of Joshua. So in the book of Joshua, we read about God giving Joshua an instruction as it relates to conquering Jericho. And so I'm going to read a little bit for you. Joshua chapter 6, we're going to read from verse 2 down to 5. It says, And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I will deliver Jericho and her king and her warriors into your hands. Let all your troops march around the city and complete one circuit of the city. Do this six days. So the people were to march around Jericho for six days. Every day, they were supposed to circle the city one time. It says, with seven priests carrying seven ram's horns preceding the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the horns. Now I wanna stop here to say this. I think it was in our teaching on the first day of Sukkot, I made the point that a lot of people don't feel comfortable when we talk about the importance and significance of numbers in scripture. A lot of people don't like the concept of gematria and all of that stuff. And I said that that's going to be a problem because scripture is based upon um, the use of numbers and codes and all of these things. Um, Torah is not only words. Torah also is based, it's very mathematical. It's based upon formulas and all of those things. And so what we find in scripture is a, the use of numbers. We all know that the number seven speaks to perfection and it speaks to a number of different things, but this is the number of God, okay? The number seven. And so what we find in this uh, passage here from the book of Joshua, God said to Joshua, have the troops circle the city. You're to do this for six days. So for six days, the people are going to walk around the city one time. But as the people are going, this is what you need. Seven priests carrying seven ram's horns. And on the seventh day, they were to march around the city seven times with the seven priests. When a long blast is sounded on the horn, as soon as you hear that sound of the horn, all the people shall give a mighty shout. 
Thereupon the city wall will collapse and the people shall advance every man straight ahead. Now, the walls of Jericho, the people who lived in the city had great faith in the walls of Jericho. They thought the walls could not be penetrated. The walls were sturdy and strong and they were secure in their city, right? But by doing what Hashem said, this kind of ritual caused the walls of Jericho to fall. Now, here is what was happening as the people were doing what Hashem told them to do. It's as if in some supernatural way that we are not able to understand fully. It's as if the people were invoking Hashem's presence, the presence of Hashem himself into this battle. And Hashem was the one who was going to crush the walls. The walls were going to come down because Hashem himself was going to cause this wall to crumble. Okay? So whatever it was that God told them to do, it was going to trigger his voice. It was going to trigger his presence. And the people would have victory. Hashem himself would break the walls of Jericho down flat. Now, let's go back to the temple times and also what we do in our synagogues today. When the priests were going around the altar, right? And on Hoshana Rabbah, they're going around the altar seven times and they're praying the, the Hoshana prayers. And when we go around the Bima and on Hoshana Rabbah, we are praying the Hoshiano prayer and we're saying, Hashem help us, Hashem save us, Hashem cause us to succeed and so on and so forth. And we get to the point where we begin to beat the willows on the ground. It is a calling, it is an invoking of the presence of Hashem. And so this is why the Hoshano prayers end with the voice. Because when we ask Hashem to come, he comes. Now, when Hashem comes, there are two things that will happen, okay? He reveals himself, but if the people are not prepared, spiritually, physically, and in every other way, it can be a very dangerous thing. When God was going to reveal himself at Mount Sinai. He said to Moses, cordon off the mountain because the people cannot touch the mountain. Animals cannot touch the mountain because anything that touches the mountain without my permission is going to die. And tell the people that they have to wash their clothes, they have to take a bath, they have to um, abstain from marital relations. Why? Because there has got to be a kind of ritual purity in the camp. Because if there is no ritual purity in the camp and Hashem puts in his appearance or he is revealed to the people, they will die. Okay? So when Hashem is about to be revealed, when he is revealing himself, it can be very, very dangerous, okay? And this is one of the reasons, too, why the people, um, when they are about to close the Hoshana, pray, um, um, the Hoshana, Hoshana Rabbah ceremony, they begin to beat the willow on the ground. Why? Because the five sprigs, five speaks to grace, in some kind of supernatural and spiritual way, it's like deflecting the judgment that could come to an individual in the presence of God. 
And this is one interpretation, by the way, because there are multiple different interpretations as to what the beating of the of this of the willow on the ground means. But one um, scholar made the point that it could be a kind of deflection that Israel is doing when the willow is being beaten on the ground. It's like Hashem, have mercy upon me. Give me grace. And it's some kind of deflection of the punishment of God upon the individual. And it's as if the willow is experiencing this beating, this punishment that could come to an individual if they are not pure before Hashem. So, during the time of Joshua, when the people did this ritual, they were summoning Hashem. And in the shul, when we do this, this ritual on Hoshana Rabbah, it's a kind of summoning to Hashem. And when it was done in the temple period, it was also a type of summoning of Hashem. And it has meaning in the future. And we are going to now look at the deeper insights into Hoshana Rabbah every year. On Hoshana Rabbah, when all of these rituals are being done, what are the people doing without even realizing what they're doing? What is Israel doing without even realizing what Israel is doing? We are going to go to scripture, the book of Revelation in particular, because the book of Revelation holds a lot of insights. How so? In the Torah, these feast days and holy days were given to us, but their meanings, their deeper meanings are concealed. It is in the book of Revelation where things are revealed. And even in the book of Revelation, there are some things that are concealed, right? But if we want to have a greater understanding of Hoshana Rabbah, we're going to have to go to the book of Revelation. So the first place that I want us to go is to Revelation chapter 10. Because in Revelation chapter 10, we're going to see a striking similarity. I want us to pick up from verse 1. We're going to read all the way down to um, verse 4. It says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and he gave a loud shout like a roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Now, as I shared with you before, every time we see in scripture a voice thundering from heaven, it's usually in reference to the father. When Israel was getting the revelation of God at Mount Sinai and the revelation of his Torah, the scriptures tell us that they heard a voice, then they saw the voices of thunder. And this was as if Hashem spoke in one voice, but his voice was so powerful that it sounded like the sound of many thunders. So they heard the voice of God, but they saw voices of thunder. Now, in the book of Revelation, he saw this angel and he said when he saw this angel, the angel gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted, he heard the voices of seven thunders speak. And when the seven thunders spoke, he was about to write, but he heard a voice saying to him, seal up what the thunders say. Do not write it down. 
I want to take us back to how the Hoshana Rabbah service was closed. The Hoshana Rabbah service is closed with a prayer that talks about a voice that is proclaiming and declaring, but it doesn't tell us what the voice proclaims or declares. We are not allowed to know what the voice proclaims or declares. Here, John says, when the thunder spoke, he heard a voice that said to him, do not write what the thunders have said. Do not write what the voices of the thunders said. So it's the same, it, it, so it, there is a striking similarity here, right? Because during John's time, this prayer was said at the end of ever Hoshana Rabbah service. And everybody knew that the voice that declared what we really don't know what the voice declared was actually God's voice in response to the people crying out for salvation. Okay? And so in Revelation chapter 10, John is alluding to Hoshana Rabbah. He is alluding to how the service ended with this prayer that talks about a voice speaking and declaring, sounding like thunder, but nobody knows what this voice says. That's powerful. Because I shared with you as we were going through the book of Revelation that if you don't have an under, if we don't have an understanding of the feast days, Revelation is going to get lost on us because Revelation is taking place during the fall feasts. And everything that happens during the fall feasts, you will have elements of it in the book of Revelation. And it is used in some kind of cryptic way to give us an understanding of what is going to take place in the end time. So, with that said, what is the prophetic significance of Hoshana Rabbah? We have to go to Revelation chapter 20. Okay, we're going to read from verse 1 through to verse 6. It says, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. It goes down and it says, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Yeshua and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with the Messiah a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. It says, Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of, um, of the Messiah and will reign with him for a thousand years. So here we have the messianic era being written about. John is talking about what things will be like during the time when the Messiah sets up his kingdom upon the earth and will rule and reign for a thousand years. Now, this messianic era is a picture of Sukkot. It's a picture of the kingdom of God, right? When all of God's people would be under a sukkah, under his protection, under his watch care. So this 1,000 year reign of the Messiah is a picture of Sukkot. But Sukkot has a seventh day, Hoshana Rabbah, where the people are crying out to God and asking him to save them. 
Hoshia na, Hoshia na, save us, save us, God save us, God save us. But you might say, but why is it that people would be calling out to Hashem to save them during this time? And why is it that we would have a day called the great salvation during this time? Yeshua is upon the earth and he is ruling and reigning in righteousness. So what would happen at the end of Yeshua's millennial reign that would trigger people to be praying for salvation? What would happen? Why would people be crying out and asking for salvation at the end of the messianic era? The book of Revelation tells us. So let's read from verse seven. It says, when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and he will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog or Gog and Magog to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand of the seashore. Remember, before the Mashiach comes, right? there is going to be a battle and Israel the land is going to be invaded and all the nations are going to come together and they're going to invade the holy land and it is at that time that the Messiah is going to come and he is going to wage war against the enemies of God and he is going to gather the exiles, return us to the land, return the people to the land. There is going to be a restoration and a rebuilding of the city, the temple and everything and the establishment of God's kingdom upon the earth. But Revelation 20 tells us that at the end of the messianic era, there is going to be an attempted invasion of the holy city. It tells us that at the end of the thousand year reign, when Hasatan is let loose, once again, he is going to go and deceive the nations and he's going to rally the nations. And the scriptures tell us that the, the, the holy land will be surrounded by the nations. It says their number would be, will be like sand on the seashore. John saw that they marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves, right? And so, I hope that you're getting this. And so, when in the shows on Hoshana Rabbah, when people are crying and saying, Hoshiana, Hoshiana, save us, save us, save us, God, save us, give us success, give us success. It is prophetic and it is pointing to this second time when Gog and Magog, the nations of the world, will surround the land of Israel one last time and will try to wage war upon the city of God. And so by calling out to God and asking him to save, they are going to be invoking the name of Hashem just like the people who were marching around the walls of Jericho when God says, this is what I want you to do. You are to march around the city. You are to sound the shofar and you are to do what I say that you are to do. It's an act of invoking Hashem's presence. It's like calling Hashem and saying, come, come now. And so it tells us that at the end of the Messiah's reign upon the earth, this is going to happen. And it says that 
the nations of the world are going to try one last time to destroy God's people. But this is what it says. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. What are we to understand here? The people, by their crying to Hashem and saying, Hoshiana, God himself is going to answer. It says fire came down from heaven and devoured them. At the end of the messianic era, when the enemy is let loose and he rallies the nation to come and wage war with God's people one last time, God himself is going to be revealed. God himself is going to be revealed. As God revealed himself at Mount Sinai, in Exodus, when he was about to give the Torah, so it is that God himself is going to be revealed on this Hoshana Rabbah in the future. All this time, from the beginning of the Messiah's coming, his first coming, his second coming, God revealed himself through his son. Okay? He reveals himself through the Torah. But on Hoshan Rabbah in the future, God is going to reveal himself personally. Man will now have a revelation of God. Not only Israel, but all of humanity. And when God comes, when God is revealed, humanity will not be able to stand the revelation of Hashem. Right? Because when he comes, he is, he, he, it's, it's as if, you know, like he said to Moshe, I can't show you my full glory. I can only show you a little bit of me. So I'm going to hide you in the rock and you can only see my back. On Hoshana Rabbah in the future, all of God, all of his glory, will be completely and totally revealed to man. We're going to continue to read what's going to happen at Hoshan Rabbah in the future. It says, fire came down from heaven and devoured them, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. So, this is going to be something that the earth has never experienced. Let's continue. It says, then I saw a great white throne. This great white throne that John saw was Hashem's throne. The great white throne. Throne. And by the way, this is why Hoshana Rabbah is called the great salvation. Because this day in the future is talking about a day when God is going to save his people. There is going to be mass salvation on a level that has never been seen before. Because God himself will be revealed. Let's continue reading. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence. Now this is how we know that this is not talking about the Messiah. Because the Messiah would have already been upon the earth, ruling and reigning for, reigning for a thousand years, and the earth and the sky did not flee from his presence. But this great white throne, when the great white throne is revealed, this, the scripture says, earth and sky fled. I want you to know that the sky kind, kind of creates a, a separation between this realm and the heavenly realm. Okay? So when the earth and the sky flee, Everybody will have a revelation of God and his throne will be seen. It says, and there was no place for them. 
And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. So when the throne of Hashem is, is revealed, even the dead has to get up. Why? Because in the presence of God, there can be no death. So even the dead will arise because the source of life is going to be revealed. So even the dead has to wake up. It says, and, and, and um, there are now the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them and each person was judged according to what he had done. Okay, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, we read that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And we also read that at the end of that, the, the son will hand over the kingdom to the, will hand back the kingdom to the father. And so my friends, this is the significance of Hoshan Rabbah. Hoshan Rabbah, is called the great salvation because it is the day when Hashem will be revealed. It is the day when he himself will step down and will save his people. It is that day when his voice will thunder and it will thunder in such a way that the earth and the sky is going to flee. Salvation is coming to his people who are alive and who are crying out for help because the nations have surrounded the city and the number of the nations surrounding the city is more than they can even begin to imagine. And it is also the great salvation because those who have been asleep will now be raised. It is also the great salvation because death and Hades will not be no more. The enemy will be no more. All the limitations will be no more. Which takes us to understanding why there was a beating or is a beating of the willow in the ceremony today. Because when Hashem comes like that, right? Those who are not ceremonially clean will be destroyed also. So it's as if his people are saying, come, but when you come, grant us grace, grant us grace. We know that we're in the flesh, but when you come, grant us grace. Okay. And also the ceremony of the water libation, we are going to see fulfilled in its ultimate fulfillment. Because Yeshua said that those who believe in him would get this outpouring of the spirit and living waters would flow out of that individual, okay? And the writer of the book of John said, this is in reference to the spirit that would be given. Now, what a lot of us fail to understand is that Although there was a pouring out of the Ruach HaKodesh in the book of Acts, right? That was just a foretaste. That was just a foretaste of what is going to come in the future, okay? When Yeshua comes, there is going to be another outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh. But on Hoshana Rabbah, when God is revealed, there is going to be another outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh. And this is why water is sin significant to this uh, um, ritual that is performed during Sukkot. So Sukkot is really a time of preparing people for Hoshana Rabbah for the great salvation. And this is why 
during the messianic era the scriptures tell us that the people from the nations who don't go up to Jerusalem to, to celebrate um, the Feast of Tabernacles will not get any rain. Why? Because during the Messianic era, the celebration of Sukkot is symbolic. It is pointing to what is going to happen on Hoshana Rabbah and also the eighth day. After God himself, reveals himself on Hoshana Rabbah. Do you know what next day is? The next day is known as the eighth day. It is known as eternity. So, on Hoshana Rabbah, there is going to be an outpouring of the Spirit because everybody who is going to enter into the eighth day must get a washing with the Spirit. Because the spirit is a what? A life-giving spirit. So now you understand the significance of this water pouring ceremony that happens during Sukkot. And now you understand the importance of the willows, right? That the priests would use in temple days to decorate the altar. And now you understand the beating of the willows on the ground in the shoes today. And now you should even have a greater understanding of the sukkah. Because although the messianic era, right, is going to be a time of universal peace and joy and rejoicing and it's going to be a time of universal knowledge when everybody on earth will know that there is God, right? The messianic era is also going to be temporary. The messianic era is not permanent. That's why it's likened to a sukkah. Okay? But it is pointing to something that is going to be permanent. It is pointing to the um it is pointing to the olam haba. It is pointing to that time in eternity when God's tabernacle is going to be among men. Right? And so this is why you now when we get down to Revelation chapter 21, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now, the dwelling of God is with man. So first we have Hoshana Rabbah, where we see um, Hashem being revealed. But then after Hoshana Rabbah, then we enter into this period of time called eternity. And this is what tomorrow represents. Tomorrow is known as Shemini Atzeret. In Israel, Shemini Atzeret and Simchat Torah are celebrated on one day. Simchat Torah is um, a, a, a celebration, right, where people dance with the Torah scroll and it signifies a new Torah cycle. So next Shabbat, we begin a new Torah cycle. But friends, all of these things are prophetic, right? Because Shemini Atzeret or the eighth day is pointing to eternity. And the fact that in eternity, people are dancing around with the Torah is also telling us something prophetic. It's saying that when we enter into eternity, there is going to be a new type of Torah. We're going to see a new Torah cycle. We're going to see a different type of Torah. And we've spoken about this already when we did the teaching on the tree of life and the river of life. Very, very awesome things that are 
in the book of God, in the word of God. And he has given us keys to unlock and keys to understanding his um, redemption plan for mankind. On the great day of salvation, on the last day of the feast, I pray that you get a different kind of insight into what's going to happen in the end times, at the end of the messianic era, when God himself will be revealed upon the earth, when everyone will hear his voice. And when that is going to um, change everything that humanity ever knew and the great gift of eternity that awaits the people of God. I pray that you have been blessed by our time together, our study together, and I pray that as we continue throughout this beautiful day with so much rich spiritual significance, you will continue to seek Hashem, that you will pray, that you will seek Him, that you will just bask in His goodness, bask in His presence, and hear what the Ruach HaKodesh has to say to you, to your heart personally today. I want to take this opportunity to remind you that we have a biblical command to bring a special offering to God on the feast days. If you have not yet brought your Sukkot offering to Hashem, please, now is the time to do so. The link as to how you can do so is in the description box below. I also need to let you know that tomorrow, which is the eighth day, is a separate event, a separate holy day from Sukkot. It is called the eighth day, but it is a separate holiday, okay? And Hashem's instructions for the eighth day is also that a special offering is supposed to be brought to him. Until we meet again, Hag Sameach, and may Hashem bless and keep you and your household in perfect peace. Music